So uh, good day, everybody. Uh, we're joined by Lisa Martin, who um, is in Ontario and uh, is joining us as a stage two colon cancer survivor. Uh, she was diagnosed in 2019. Um, and Lisa's here to talk to us, uh, walk us through the emotional journey of being a colon cancer patient and now a survivor. So uh, without further ado, I introduce you to, to Lisa and uh, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, Lisa. Sure. So I'm Lisa and I am a mother of one daughter who's five years old and I work um, at Niagara College full time and um, yeah, I uh, unfortunately had uh, colon cancer and I really just want to shine light on the mental health components of dealing with the cancer diagnosis today. It's definitely under discussed and uh, an incredibly important part for for everybody from uh, at all stages of the of the cancer journey. So thank you for for sharing so openly with us today. Um, what age were you diagnosed at, Lisa? I was diagnosed when I was thirty five years old. Okay, so considered an early age onset. Yeah. Um, so maybe you can walk us through a little bit the days leading up to that diagnosis um, and then, you know, kind of move into the day of the diagnosis. What did that look like? How did that, how, how, what were you feeling? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so I was showing some signs of colorectal cancer um, and I had seen my family doctor and he ordered a colonoscopy. Um, I also had an ultrasound done unrelated that um, incidentally sh did show a mass in my bowel area. So those things happen like simultaneously. Um, so obviously I was really concerned, you know, after having rectal bleeding was a main symptom and then a mass being found, my mind went to, you know, the worst possible case scenario, yeah. of course. Um, but then when I met with the surgeon that was performing my colonoscopy for the consultation, he really encouraged me that, you know, it's highly unlikely that it's cancer. Um, it's probably Crohn's disease or, or something else. And so I left that appointment feeling like encouraged. Oh, I can breathe. Exactly. Relieved. And yeah. like, okay, like this, this is fine. And two days later, I'll go for a colonoscopy and just everything's going to be fine. And yeah. So, yeah, as you can imagine, um, when I went for the procedure, I woke up from it and I was really foggy. <laughs> so it was kind of, yeah, with them telling me after just waking up, I was, yeah, not really all fully cognitively there. Yeah. So it was, yeah, it was hard. But I remember they asked me um, if they wanted me to get my mom to come in the room. And I said, sure. I honestly, my mind didn't go anywhere um, at that point. And yeah, I, there's bits and pieces that I remember. Um, I remember the surgeon saying, we found what we were hoping we wouldn't find and it actually is cancer. And I literally like, heard nothing after those words um yeah. and then you know they were doing a lot of different tests that day to see if it had spread and my husband came to be with me and yeah it was just the shock and I remember just apologizing to my mom and husband like then and like I just felt bad that they <laughs> he, his wife, you know, had cancer and, you know, what that would look like for him and my daughter and, you know, a parent with a child that's sick, yeah. just, you know, that's uh, one of the biggest kind of fears of a parent. Yeah. And so I did feel this kind of guilt, like I felt bad for them at the same time. Um, yeah. And I remember going into, uh, there was like this kind of TV area between tests I was waiting on and the room was filled with older people and they were probably like when I say older I'll specify like these people were probably in their 80s and yeah. I just remember sitting there looking at them and thinking like 
I am so jealous of you. You have no idea how lucky you are. And it was hard not to feel that way because like, I didn't know, um, you know, what my outcome was going to be and what cancer was going to look like for, for me. And there was a lot of, yeah, fear around that. So yeah, I just, I do remember feeling that jealousy and kind of bitter, like this isn't fair. Like this isn't how it's supposed to be. You've lived a Um, long life and here I am so young with a young family. How is this even fair? You know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I remember a couple weeks after the diagnosis, obviously there was a lot of crying and there was fear and sadness, but then I'd say after about a couple weeks, I put my armor on, I numbed everything. I just tried to go through the motions to get through the days and disassociated myself from having cancer, um, as a coping mechanism, I was in survival mode and I just really repressed everything and pushed it aside. So, okay. Interesting. So, so, you know, you bring up emotions like, you know, feeling, uh, you know, shocked about the diagnosis and then, you know, envious of these people that you're seeing who are, you know, who've lived long, prosperous lives and, you know, um, and, and wondering why you couldn't be one of those, or, you know, maybe Mm -hmm. you would be one of those, but worried that you wouldn't get to that point. Um, Also, you know, bringing up guilt about uh, feeling guilty that your husband was having to deal with a wife who had cancer and a mom who was having to deal with a child sick with cancer, Mm -hmm. a daughter, you know, whose mom was sick. So um, that's not something that we often hear from people. And certainly that's something that I'm sure a lot of people do feel. So, I mean, was this something that you brought up that you ever discussed with, you know, your husband or your mom, um, you know, even sort of your daughter, like, how did you kind of, um, how did you manage those, that emotion? Mm-hmm. Um, with my daughter, like she's still really young and doesn't mm-hmm. understand any of it, but yeah, with my husband and my mom, like, I think for me, part of it was trying to protect them and, I I am very empathetic. So I take on kind of how other people would feel in certain situations. Um, But yeah, they were very reassuring that, you know, I did nothing wrong. And they were like right there with me through everything. Um, Yeah, just that I shouldn't feel that level of guilt that I was experiencing. And it's something I'm still working through. It's not like, someone, you know, tells me something. I'm like, okay, great. Like, let's just carry on. Yeah, feel like, better now. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. something that I struggle with. Um, and yeah, I'm working through it. Okay. Okay. But, you know, I think probably the take home there would be that, you know, you didn't, you didn't manage that emotion on your own, that you reached out and you, you know, you expressed how it was impacting you. And then it led to an important conversation and important reassurance, Mm -hmm. um, you know, from your mom and your husband that in fact, you know, um, they, they were there for you and they wanted to be there for you. And they felt none of this, you know, frustration or or disappointment Mm -hmm. or whatever, whatever it was that maybe you thought they felt so uh, important to sort of keep the lines of communication open. Um, And then you talk now about disassociating and numbing. So Mm want to know a little bit more about that in terms of, um, Number one, I mean, how, how, uh, you know, like how, how does one kind of just put on that armor? How, how did you, how did you find the strength um, and the resilience to kind of just push forward, uh, you know, despite these very heavy emotions? And then what did that look like? You know, was it, did it, did it impact your relationships um, in, in a sense that it caused a bit of isolation or disengagement? Can you talk to me a little bit about Mm -hmm. that, Lisa? Yeah. Um, So when I put on my armor and kind of disassociate, to me, that's not being strong. Um, Being strong would be actually feeling kind of authentically how I feel instead of kind of not feeling those really complex, uncomfortable feelings. 
Um, so I did get comments from people. You're so strong. You're so positive. You're so brave. And yeah, like I was all of those things, but I just really was not like, it, it sounds strange how you can kind of disassociate yourself from an experience that you're in. But I think when you're thrown into something like cancer, a really kind of traumatic um, event, it can be a coping mechanism a lot of people turn to. Um, for me, it looked like distracting myself and being busy. Like I was still working. I was carrying on, you know, normal life. Um, I wasn't being genuine, though, with how... I was feeling or what was going on. And I was trying to protect other people. Um, and I would do that by, you know, when telling someone about the cancer diagnosis, I always followed it up quickly with, but it was caught early and I'm going to be fine. And yeah, all of these kind of reassuring things that I'm like encouraging other people. Um, but then I didn't allow myself to actually fall apart, whereas yeah. people around me were. Okay. At that time, when I was initially diagnosed and going through the treatment, I didn't give myself space to do that yet. Okay. And that didn't come until after the physical part of dealing with cancer was over with for me. And then, and then kind of the to... mental part caught up to the physical body. And I think it is hard mentally and physically to fight this disease at the same time and I was just using all my capacity to physically fight it um yeah the mental part I just couldn't even do I couldn't do it at the time I couldn't I okay. couldn't even go there to be honest so the numbing and the dissociation you would sort of um, attribute to uh, your form of survival, you know, it was sort mm -hmm. of the only way that you could get through because like you said, it's interesting. Um, you can't deal with the emotional and the physical at the same time, um, you know, and, and, and you bringing up the, 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 the aspect of dissociation. So, you know, a lot of patients will say that, um, you know, once treatments are over, it's reconnecting with your body, you know, because mm -hmm. you physically disassociate from your body. Um, you kind of detach because it's a very painful process, whether you're undergoing surgery or, mm -hmm. you know, other treatments, chemo, radiation, all of it, um, right. whatever. Uh, these, these treatments are very physically daunting. Yes. yes. So, you but you're bringing really the emotional, think. yeah, yeah. You you're can't trying think. to like breathe through the pain and get through till you can, you know, get some more medication to help you get feeling, you know, a little bit better. So you, yeah, you're just kind of getting, literally getting through the day each day when you're thrown into the physical battle. Yeah. The focus really is on, is on the physical, I guess, um, survival, um, you know, and like you said, then, you know, then comes the other part where it's like, wow, um, all these emotions are now flooding. Um, but did it, did it, did this dissociation, did you notice like, uh, that it impacted relationships or you still managed to kind of, uh, not isolate yourself and ask for help when you, mm -hmm. you know, when you needed. Yeah, I would say I, I definitely didn't isolate myself. Um, and I did stay connected with people, but I just wasn't honest and true and authentic, I guess, with how I was feeling. It was just yourself. talking about other things and, you know, busying myself. And mm -hmm. it wasn't me actually expressing how I was feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think people sort of people's reaction to that tends to be positive because nobody wants that gloomy conversation about like, Oh, I'm having such a hard time dealing with my cancer or, mm -hmm. you know, it's really impacting me and I can't get out of bed because like mentally I'm just fried or, you know, there people sort of are, are, are so 
happy and and relieved when a mm-hmm. cancer patient's like, yeah, no, I'm doing well. Everything's great. I'm beating it. And it's right. You know. Right. <laughs> um, so like what did you do uh at, at at a certain point in time to sort of like gain control mm-hmm. of these emotions? Mm-hmm. Um, um yeah. So I would say coming up on my one year scans is really when I started just having almost like a dark cloud over me. And what I was doing wasn't working. Um, A lot of people would try to give me pep talks and say, you know, you beat cancer, like you go girl, you can do anything and you should be grateful, you should be happy and all of these things that I'm thinking, okay, like, but I'm not feeling those like, yeah, I'm grateful and happy and everything, but I'm also feeling really not good about this. And I didn't feel like I had the space to really let those emotions out. Mm. And so I actually, um, one of the things I did for myself is I reached out for counseling and it's one of the best investments I've made in myself. Um, It's been life altering for sure. And being able to recognize um, that I was numbing and that I hadn't allowed myself to actually um, truly feel these things and having the safe space to do so and just tools and strategies of how I could release these kind of emotions that I had stored away. Um, Yeah, so things like writing in a journal um, has helped me to get just everything kind of out and on paper. I've been really just through counseling, I've been able to connect better with like other people in my life and be able to be more authentic in how I'm feeling and not always feel like I have to be this really positive person about things that, you know, it's okay to not feel okay and to have those down days and Yeah, like I want to bring up toxic positivity because that's something that I know, I feel like our culture ingrains that in us at a young age that, you know, we have to maintain positivity and kind of discard all the other kind of emotions at any cost, you know, regardless of the situation. So I've been always guilty of doing that and like distracting myself with things so that I wouldn't have to feel discomfort and painful you know feelings and we all want that quick fix and we want to just be able to magically feel better and not have to feel pain but eventually that catches up to you or that will come out in other ways it can come out you know as bitterness as anger and that's gonna be um kind of towards people you love these feelings that you haven't like dealt with in a healthy way so I didn't want that to happen obviously but then I had to come to terms with you know I am gonna have a lot of days that are not good days and that's it's been really hard the past couple years for me to actually sit in the discomfort and to not feel happy and to not you know feel like it was a good day because I used to always think like you know, every day, make it a good day, but that's not reality. And that's not life. Like hardships happen to all of us. So I've been able to kind of accept that more and just allow myself to feel what I'm truly feeling. That's such an important message. You know, um, I think you're right. It is very ingrained in our culture uh, from the time we're little, you know, uh, and we cry or whatever. It's like, how do we soothe? How do we become soothed? You know, what do we, how do we respond to it? No one's, no one's comfortable with seeing people um, unhappy or in mm-hmm. despair. Um, and, and it's often sort of, you know, maybe our fear of how other people might react to it. Um, right. You know, we don't want other people to uh, to feel like we're, you know, we're not capable or we're not managing. Um, yeah, we're too emotional, or too emotional. you don't want people to think you're a downer and oh, <laughs> that girl again, like you know, <laughs> you don't want to be like a pity party either. So yeah, it, it's hard for me, for sure. 
Yeah. In that respect. When we were talking um, a little while back, you had mentioned that, you know, one of the things that, uh, that ha- helped you sort of, um, you know, helped you kind of um, manage all of this uh, was, was knowing that, you know, it wasn't always going to be like this, you know, mm-hmm. you, you would mm-hmm. get, you know, there, there are good days and bad days and Definitely. that's okay. Um, and, and so that, that just juxtaposition sometimes is something people don't really seem to understand, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, you talked about coexisting feelings, you know, um, feeling, you know, maybe like, uh, you know, fe- feeling grateful, but feeling really scared or, mm-hmm. you know, really like anxious. Right. Um, so can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. I just thought like it was one or the other. Like yeah. I, I didn't really recognize that feelings could coexist and yeah, I could be feeling really defeated one day, mm-hmm. but I'm, also feeling great that I've overcome everything that I have. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of different times where I would just have a day that I felt so happy and grateful. And the next day, maybe I'd feel really kind of disappointed about what I've had to go through. And that's okay. Like I can feel all of these things. I don't have to just selectively feel one thing and you can't selectively just choose what you want to feel. And then numb or push aside everything else, like it doesn't work that way. Yeah. So just recognizing it's okay to have, you know, all of those different complex emotions existing at the same time. Yeah. Cohabitating. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> In a friendly, not hostile environment. <laughs> um, and another thing that you had mentioned, and I think this is so important to say, is that healing is not linear. Mm -hmm, definitely Um, talk to me about that non-linear yeah it's true um physically I learned that um (laughs) going through this you know I would think I'm feeling better and and things are going well and I'd have another setback and then I would be taking you know literally steps back like I was beginning to be able to walk again and go further down the hall at the hospital and then I'd have a setback and I was having to be in bed for days and then like so physically I truly learned that healing is not linear but emotionally it's it's exactly the same um which can be really frustrating and it can make us feel like should I just give up right like you can easily go to that place because you're making progress um as far as healing mentally and emotionally through it and then you can have a setback or a trigger or something that happens and all of a sudden you feel like you're not moving forward with things like you're feeling things you haven't felt in a long time and you're thinking like what was that for like I'm still back at the same spot but is it all for not exactly so then it's easy to be like well just throw things aside and but that's when you have to really, really push through it because you have to look at your journey and how far you have come in that time. And it's important to recognize small wins along the way. Yes. Um, It's a slow, gradual process. It's unlearning, it's relearning. And it does, um, it's easy to get discouraged. So just recognizing small things you're doing differently or like being able to identify thoughts. Um, A lot of time we're on autopilot and we're just kind of going through the motions each day and a thought comes in and we don't actually, we just kind of have a feeling around the thought, but we don't identify or analyze that feeling. And is, is this a healthy one? Is it serving me kind of thing? So it's important to, identify the thought and maybe reframe it if it's not a healthy thought and an example that I can use in my personal life is last year when I was going to uh, the cancer clinic for a scan I remember my husband and my daughter who was four at this time they dropped me off at the appointment my husband took my daughter to the park they couldn't come in the hospital um, because of restrictions and then you know they were picking me up after And I just remember thinking, like, this is not fair. Like, 
my husband and daughter shouldn't be taking me to a cancer clinic. And I just felt so much sadness around this thought. And it's important to let yourself feel those things and like be able to get that out um, and express them. But then after like turning that into more of a positive thought and kind of reframing it. So then I was trying to think of it as, you know, they're taking me to this place where my life was saved, where all of these different medical professionals, um, you know, I had access to getting surgery and these treatments done. And I'm here today because of all of these professionals working on it. Yep. So trying to just um, kind of shed light on it and uh, reframe it into something more positive and just more of a healthy thought to have. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And also, you know, now they're monitoring me, you know, closely so that um, we can prevent this from happening again. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, now I know what to look out for. Uh, I've been educated. So yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. That it's a very, very uh, important thing is the, you know, trying to reframe course not always possible you know if you're Mm -hmm. in a very highly emotional state but like you said there's you know the self-reflection that comes after um that comes really after the the cancer treatments often Mm -hmm. um so yeah very very important stuff um that that you're you're talking about uh you know, feeling your way through cancer, literally. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it doesn't just end when the treatments end. Uh, no, sort of and that's almost the like a misconception. I think a lot of people like have because yeah. like physically you're done the appointments, the treatments. Shouldn't you be so happy? And, exactly. Yeah. You look like yourself, right? Yep. So they just, yeah, people can easily think like, yeah, like you beat cancer, like you should be on top of the world. Yeah. And not really. And you don't know. And like, like I get it. Yeah. Like, if you haven't been through it, how do you know that? Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's important to kind of make people aware that, you know, after that storm is all over with, there's a whole other storm mentally that someone yeah. is having to deal with and having to process a lot of complex emotions and having to work through them and process trauma and it's something we need support with you can't do it on your own yeah it's interesting right like you know you you go through this and and uh I personally didn't have a bell to ring at the end of my chemo but some Mm. people do um and so you know you're sort of like that's that's the the like you know that's the big the big payoff, you know, I'm going right. to ring that bell. And like, yeah. I know and then it's over and then it's over. It. Yeah. yeah. We, can, we can just walk out of here. Like it never happened. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, certainly, um, you know, that, that, that was my train of thought and something that kept me going throughout the, the treatment process was, um, and, and you talked to me about this as well. So, mm-hmm. so I know you identify as like, um, you know, what are the things that I want to do when I'm, when this is mm-hmm. done, like, what am I going to do? What are we going to plan for? For me, it was like a right. big party and every, every week it'd be like, I'm going to add this to the mix and we're right. going to have a fountain and we're going to have this <laughs> and we're that. And then when everything was over, it was the last thing I wanted to do. Right. So, yeah. you know, it's really like, you know, the heaviness of everything just kind of falls at that point. And, um, and I think that's, that's a really, really important point to drive home is that, um, and maybe this is where you can help us sort of shed mm-hmm. light on what caregivers or support networks can do to support somebody, you know, during for sure. Um, Mm -hmm. but also, you know, even after when everything is said and done and you should be happy, right? what can people do? Or maybe we should back up and say what Mm -hmm. people shouldn't do. Start with that. (laughs) Right. Right. Um, yeah, like I might've mentioned this earlier. I know we've talked about it before. Um, you shouldn't give the person a pep talk and you shouldn't, (laughs) you shouldn't say, um, things like, You've you got this. Cancer. You could do it. Yeah, you got this. <laughs> Look how far you come. You're so lucky. And at least, like the words, at least you don't say. At least you didn't have to do this particular treatment. At least you were diagnosed at this stage. Like at least, at least, at least. Yeah. Because it makes us feel like maybe I shouldn't have these feelings. It really dismisses what we're feeling and it minimizes it. Yeah. And then 
it doesn't make us feel very good. Um, so yeah, that's something you shouldn't do. Now we'll get into kind of things that you can do um, to be supportive. So I would say um, being a safe place for someone. So what that looks like is sitting with them and listening to their feelings. Um, you don't have to try to make them feel better. It's not going to be comfortable. I will tell you that. But you have to sit in the discomfort, lean into it, and let the person express what's truly authentically in their heart and how they're feeling. And, you know, validating. Yes, this is a really hard thing you went through. I can't imagine what it was like, but I am here and I will support you, whatever that looks like to you. Um, so yeah, I would say just getting comfortable with being uncomfortable um, yeah. is how I would put it. And yeah, checking in is huge. Even just a text, thinking of you, how are you doing? Do you want to go for coffee? Like different things like that um, yeah. Yeah. are really effective. And they seem like small things, but I mean, a lot of people don't do those things. And <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think we're always told as patients, you know, don't isolate yourself, make sure that you reach out, make sure that you have a good support system around you. But I think that in general, there's such a discomfort, especially with young patients, mm -hmm. you know, oh my God, it's so scary. This person could die. Like, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. What am I going to sound dumb? Like it right. would probably, I don't right. want to bother them, you know, right. they've been through so much, but you know, yeah. now we're in the age of texting and I think that's huge. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, certainly if you're going through treatments, you're, you may not have the energy to entertain like a 45 minute conversation right. about what's going on, but mm -hmm. certainly just even reading a text, even if you don't answer back right. just like hey thinking of you like you said yeah. or yeah. you know um you know, I, I'm sending you all you know, I used to love mm -hmm. getting these texts, like sending healing vibes. And I was like, Oh, yeah. you know, oh, it like, does. It makes, it it makes a difference. difference. It's very yeah. encouraging. Right. Yeah. And it, it gives you that extra little bit of energy to be able to push forward. Right. Getting that support from someone, it just fills you up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I know it's, it's hard because it's not a comfortable thing and yeah. people don't want to say the wrong thing. Right. But what I would say to that is you can literally say to someone, I don't want to say the wrong thing. <laughs> yes, but it's I'm so here. true. I yes. am here. Those three words, right? It's so well said, Lisa. And uh, yeah, like if you do this, say something and it's, you know, upsetting, we're going to get past it. We're just happy you're there supporting us. Like we will give you yeah. grace and we're all human, right? Yeah. And you're not always going to have the words to say, but just simply being there, that goes a really long way. Yeah. I think a, a little, uh, a little tip for, you know, when you feel like you've really put your foot in your mouth, I'll, I'll say to myself, I'll say to somebody, can I have some water to flush that foot down? You yeah. Know? <laughs> so yeah, I mean, humor is definitely, yeah. I think uh, a big part of it. Um, and, uh, and giving people the permission to not know what to say. It's okay. Mm -hmm. You don't know what to say. I just right. knowing that you're in my life. And knowing that you're thinking about me is, mm -hmm. is, is enough is all I really right. need, you know, because no one's solving this problem. Like, no, it's, you're not going to fix it. They're like, not going to fix it. You know, so. Yeah. yeah. So just, um, ju just, just be by their side, you know? Just be um, there. Yeah. So, I mean, this has been really, really phenomenally eye-opening, um, shedding light on this very important topic, Lisa. And I, you know, and I know that you're out there spreading the word about, you know, mental health, uh, during and through cancer, um, and beyond. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's a huge contribution to the community. So, um, really grateful that you are here to join us today and, uh, look forward to having more conversations like this. Thank you. I just want to thank you for giving me this platform to, uh, to share openly. Yeah. It's not easy to be vulnerable, but um, I'm hoping that in me being vulnerable, it'll encourage others to be able to as well. So yeah, I have so much more I could share. So I'd love to do some follow-ups. We will, um, we will this, do that, yes. Because I feel like we kind of, you know, touch the surface, but I think it's a good starting point. 
Great. And, and may I say also, you know, when we post this on our YouTube channel, um, certainly anybody out there watching this, please comment on the bottom, you know, if there's topics that you want us to cover about mental health, you know, we'll check in with Lisa and, you know, have more discussions about specific topics uh, that, that are of interest to, um, to the general community out there. So thanks for watching and uh, we'll, we'll speak soon. Thanks for having me.